Pizza Podcast. This is the Pizza Expo Las Vegas edition of this shit. And we got a real special guest, Giovanni Maro. Ma- Maro. I know it's from a Manzu last name. Pizza. All right. This guy, I fucking met this guy tonight at Vinny Rotolo's spot, Good Pie. He's doing some old school Sicilian shit over there, which I am fucking obsessed with, all about. That's my fucking culture. Uh, even though I'm Neapolitan Sicilian, I love the Sicilian shit a little bit more. I'm really sorry, all my Neapolitan friends. I love you guys too, but like. Meanwhile, you know, he's got a trinacria on his uh, a bicep over here. That, that's fucking right. All right? Because we're all about that Sicilian shit and fucking graves that But Nino, you know, I've got to ask you a question. I know, I know I'm here to be interviewed by you. Yeah. But, but I got I, I to gotta ask, ask me whatever I the fuck you We're question. hanging out over here. Listen. You brought out the Ferne Branco over here. We're, we're sitting out. We just had a great event. And I just want to chill with you. And I've got to ask, Nino, where does the name Nino come from? Coniglio, great Sicilian name. Coniglio. Yeah. So, so the- Nino comes from Antonino. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's all. So I mean, grandfather or uncle or? Uh, no, no. My grandfather was Luigi. My father was Sal. Well, it could have been Luigino. Uh, yeah, but it wasn't. It was just Antonino. I don't know. I there wasn't any rhyme and reason for it. Like I, I, I have a bunch of friends in Brooklyn who, so the Fortunato family, for instance, right? They're like George Foreman over there. They named all the fucking kids in a single generation Biagio. So there's like 18 Biagio. Then you got two brothers pizza, who, they're big players in Staten Island. They're like really good guys. They're all named Giorgio, right? There's like 23 Giorgios in a single generation in that family. So I don't know if my father decided to change it up because of like seeing shit like that growing up and what fucking happened. But yeah. (laughs) Well, I like the name Nino for two reasons. For two reasons. One of my favorite singers growing up in Sicily was Nino D'Angelo. I don't know if you know this. uh, What was his real name? No, his name was Antonino. Antonino. Yeah, Antonio, Antonio D'Angelo. Same. But everybody called him Nino D'Angelo, a uh, pop singer. And then uh, m- also uh, my uncle. Uh, he was a butcher in the town of Licata, in, which is in the southern coast of Sicily. And a uh, great, great human being. And his, his name was Nino. And so I have, a, I have a particular affinity to the name Nino. So I had to ask. I had to oh, ask. Oh wow, Gio, from. I appreciate that. Oh. You know what I mean? I Normally just, people are like You know, the, the, the Latins say in vino veritas, which means in wine there is truth. So I'm a little tipsy, so I'm speaking truth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's what we want on this podcast. We Fair want enough. the truth. And this is he's gotta lower loud. you. I'm, I'm no loud. no no no, you're not too loud. He just can't see you on the camera. Because the, the thing is well, blocking us. I've got a mug made for radio. Mm. <laughs> you don't want me on camera. Oh no, so we, that, everybody that goes on camera. Thing. Listen, you're you're a beautiful human being, Gio. <laughs> Thank you. So what do they call you, Giovanni or Gio? Giovanni. So my full name is Giuseppe Giovanni Mauro. Okay. When I moved here, uh, they couldn't pronounce Giuseppe. See. And they could pronounce Giovanni better. Okay. So I went by Giovanni. So instead of going with Joe, you were like, let me keep it Italian. Correct. And go with Giovanni. Correct. Makes that's, sense. That's that's what happened. That's why. And then from Giovanni went to Gianni, and then from Gianni went to Gio. I so so where did you grow happened. up in Sicily? In a little town called Canicati, Provincia d'Agrigento, um, and I I switched back and forth between Canicati and Musomeli, my uh, dad's hometown, and uh, I I have to tell you every time I I say those two towns, it there there's a little tug at my heart because. Mm. The and what are those? Those are warmth? Central Sicily? Central Sicily, right okay. in the middle of the... Middle, middle of fucking middle, nowhere. Right. <laughs> middle of fucking nowhere. So we had, we had great food, and we had each other. That's what we had. That's did they have, had. like, uh, any, like, type of, like, small farm plot or anything like that? It was, all, it was all like that. I'll okay. tell you, I, I don't know why the story or this, this awareness came to mind right now, 
But I'd like to tell you a story about the European Union. Sure. My dad's hometown, town of 12,000 people. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there were about 20 families that used to make cheese. And they'd been making cheese for centuries and centuries and centuries. What kind of cheese, you know? Mostly pecorino and uh, caprino, which is goat, right? Okay. Sheep, pecorino, sheep, caprino is goat. I've never even heard of caprino. Is that like a hard cheese, soft cheese, semi-soft? It, it depends. Usually here in the States, we have our, our goat cheese is usually soft. Mm -hmm. But they dry Asian in Sicily. It's a harder cheese. Okay. I have tasted one out of Sardinia that is very similar to what my family used to make. Uh, but, but yeah, that, that, you know, it's very hilly, very mountainous, I should okay. say more than hilly. So, so, so sheep and goats did well there. You couldn't have cows right? because cows like plains. They don't like going up and down. Right. So out of, out of 12,000 people, we had 20 cheese making families. Okay. A lot of, a lot of cheeseries, right? A lot of dairy. Right. Because if it, uh, so, European Union comes in and sets, uh, sets up some health standards. Out of all of those 20 families, there's now two. Because of regulation because and all of the fucking regulations. bullshit. So, and, and look, I'm not and, one. And those people, I got to imagine, they're not like selling on even a national market. They're no, selling no, on a they're local market. Correct. For like a 500 for, years or right. whatever it is. Millennia. Yeah. These people have been making cheese since the Greeks colonized Sicily. I mean, seriously. That's this what is they did. No thousands of years. Up, no matter how many invaders they had, no matter how fucked up people fucked them in their asses, they, they made They still cheese. persevered. Yeah. They made cheese. They retreated to the center of the island. And the European unit came in and decimated that whole market. Completely Jesus. gone. There's, out, of, out of 20 families, there's two left that are making cheese because of quote unquote health standards. And look, I believe in science. I believe in health standards. There's, there's no doubt about that. But sometimes when you homogenize things, you lose heritage. And well, that's the caution in modernity. We can't lose heritage. While we make transitions to bettering humanity, we cannot lose heritage. Have you ever heard the story of the Connecticut cheese nun lady? Yes, she's awesome. Yeah. The, the nunnery, right? That you're so, just real quick, for those who don't know. So, there is, um, I forget her name. If you ever listen to this, I really apologize to you, ma'am. You're fucking amazing. You're a legend. So, and, and we apologize for the colorful language <laughs> because of your religious order. I, think I happen okay to be quite that. Catholic, but. <laughs> I think she'd be okay with it. She seems cool. So, but, um, so you're okay with saying she's fucking awesome? She's fucking awesome. All right, great. Um, 100%. <laughs> that's how I feel. Uh, yeah, fuck the curse word bullshit. Anyway, so uh, the Connecticut cheese down lady, she, uh, I believe, she went to college to be a molecular biologist. Uh, right. Studied that, graduated, later on became a nun, joined a nunnery in Connecticut that had a French name that their sister nunnery was in France. She went to France where they had been making cheese at this nunnery for like a thousand years. All right. And they use this like moldy wood barrel to do something. I don't know. It, it, it couldn't have been to boil the cheese or to make it hot. Maybe. No, they were curing it in the wood, but what they, they found. They were curing it in the wood. But. What happened was she started getting, she, she came back to Connecticut, learned from them, uh, came back, started doing this, got popular because, you know, you're in an area of affluence and you have people over there that understand that product. And the product was homemade and like better than France. And as she got popular, eventually a few years later, the health department descended upon her and said, you are going to murder people with a salmonella. Nope. And being a molecular biologist, she reached out to her alumni and her professors, um, set up a lab, challenged the health department, and won. And it turned out that this moldy wooden thing that she was doing the cheese in, that she was so worried about, that everybody was so worried about, had less a salmonella than a bleach stainless steel like cauldron that yeah. they would use imagine imagine the crazy concept that something that's worth 
worked for millennia is more valid than something that has been in science for 25, 30 years. Right. Imagine the concept. Yeah. Imagine that humanity for 30,000 years has developed civilization, has developed, and we've actually learned something from generation to generation. But all of a sudden, ladies and gentlemen, all of a sudden, in the past 50 years, we became geniuses. Right. It's unbelievable well, to me. To be a little bit Devin's advocate on that, there was a lot of things going on 200 years ago that we didn't understand, like from dysentery and cold water. But of course. that's not an excuse for like really taking a hard look without, but, she had to pay her own money to do that. But you know? what the, the validity resources. in modernity is that it doesn't take us generations to figure stuff out. Mm. It takes us years to figure stuff out. Sure. And what happens well, in science, if you look this at is it. not safe, this is safe, this is great. Yeah. But we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Well, we can't take a binary look at anything. Right. We got to take a nuanced look at what we're looking at and say, like, wait a minute. You learned this in France. They've been doing this for a thousand years. Let's take a closer look instead Correct. of being binary where it's A or B. It's either right. wrong or right. Correct. Because nothing in this world is binary. I could you I know? couldn't say it better myself. This is where so this is the this is the world I live in. And I know uh, so I, I, I'm just I I'm a I'm a natural leaven guy. Mm. I don't believe in commercial yeast. Okay. And that's where th this whole philosophy uh, that we're speaking about right now speaks to home right now. Because I don't think that yeast made in a lab is as healthy and as good for humanity as natural yeast that exists out in the world. I could put water and flour and I could give it some sugar and I could replenish it and all of a sudden I have beautiful yeast culture. Right. That's what I want to eat. I don't want to eat- But you're using sugar? No, no. Oh, okay. Never sugar. Just Never refined sugar. I might introduce a fruit to have fructose Okay. Banana peel, apple peel, half an apricot to give the yeast some food. But it really isn't even necessary because if you get fresh enough uh, wheat, it has enough sugar. Oh, yeah. They are eating the starch. Get, yeah. To get the yeast to start. Yeah. Propagating. Starch kids converted and incident, to Incidentally, sugar. propagating yeah. is a fancy way for saying having sex. The yeast right. actually have sex and propagate. Produce more yeast. Produce more yeah. yeast. 100%. And it's so, it, it's awesome. People make fun of me because, so here's the deal. Most people have cats, they have dogs, they have birds. These are all pets, right? Mm -hmm. I have yeast. <laughs> it is my yeast pet. are my it is pets. You gotta feed it at the same time every day. Every day I have to feed it at the same time. I have to make sure it's the right temperature. I gotta talk to it. I sing it. Look, I don't want to say this too loud, but I sing to my yeast every once in a while. What do you Just sing a... to your yeast? Oh, Can you I'll, sing I'll, a little bit? Uh, Imagine I'm your yeast right now. Can you sing a little bit to me? As your yeast? Oh my goodness, I have so many songs. Steve <laughs> you been a sire. That's one of the things I, 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 I just, I love my yeast. My yeast is my You're baby. You're a fucking good I, singer. Where'd you learn how to do that? That's, that's, a, that's a different story. You want... <laughs> so in a previous life, I have two loves in, in the world. Uh, besides, of course, my, my family and my kids are my first love. They're, they're, they, 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 they're sacred, right? They're number one. They're number one. Let's take them aside. But my two, my two loves in, in my uh, profession are uh, opera okay. and cooking. And cooking. And they're at, they're at equal level. And so you, early on, I, I was a, an aspiring opera singer. Really? Yeah. And I did wasn't you go to school I, for that at I, all? I, I did. did. I was an undergraduate perfor opera performance. I wasn't worth shit. That's why I'm making pizzas now. <laughs> <laughs> it but, seems like a hard day to get into. It's a small market. But that's but, like, but, but that's. But you're a great singer. Things. I heard you sing it when I was walking in here. Oh well, but that's I, that's my two things, man. I I really make no distinction. Like the love I have for opera is equivalent to the love I have for producing a great quality dough. I just it it is it is just everything to me, and I. You know, it's, it's, 
in my older, I'm a middle-aged guy, and I'm really starting, I'm starting to understand passion. Mm. Because passion is almost nonsensical. Why do you care so much about something like this? Why do you care so much about this subject? Because that's the fucking point. That is the point. That's and the that's point. my point. And so, I, I mean, seriously. And if you only care about money, like you have to care about money, like at a certain point, because at a certain point, it's a tool. But like, once you get the money, then what's the point? It's a passion. It's the making it right. What about for those of us that don't have the money yet? You got to make the money. Uh, well, <laughs> and, from your, and, as my and, Jewish and, friends would say, from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> and the, and the, the passion isn't stopping you from making the money because the passion is, um, it's valued today. In 20, we're in 2021. People value that. But how do you get that message of passion out to customers? Current and future. Well, I so so here's here's so my there's truth. where it gets tricky. It it does get tricky. And and the message, and so there's people that are brilliant at sending out the message. Mm. And I have to say that I'm not one of those people. But I here here's my belief. Yeah. My belief is that at the end of the day, if you do the right thing in in food and people can eat it and their stomach feels good and they feel good the next day they feel energetic that their food doesn't weigh them down and make them feel sick then their subconscious will tell them that that was good food correct and that's what i do because how many people have eaten pizza and the next day they feel like crap A and lot. this and this is why this whole movement of Gluten is the enemy has come about because we, and I'm going to say this out to my colleagues, we have failed as professionals to treat dough correctly. We make dough in the morning and we want to cook it for lunch. And it's absurd. It's absurd that we think that a dough is ready to bake in three hours. It doesn't exist. You cannot make a corn field happen in a week it takes the whole season and this is just nature this is the thing about dough that people need to understand fermentation is natural it is beyond man it is beyond we we can't fabricate it we have to let time and temperature do its thing and if you do that if you do that then people will feel good, and guess what? It's rewarded in flavor. Because when you have a naturally fermented product, you know, you know, how good does it taste? Oh, it tastes great. Right? And it as feels opposed good. To, as opposed to a dough that you make in two hours? But it's not an instant feeling. Like maybe people, like when they, when they eat it, if they're not educated on it, if we're not educating them, maybe they're like, Oh, well, maybe it wasn't the dough that was feeling bad. Maybe it was the shitty cheese or the sauce or something right. else. Or it's gluten. Or it's, it's gluten. gluten. Gluten is the antichrist. Yeah. I, Which is crazy. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. We have to get back to the basics. My I, motivation, my motivation was to make dough. I said, look, all these people are saying that pizza is bad. And I'm thinking about, okay, it's wheat, which is natural. Tomatoes, which is natural. It's a little bit of cheese. Protein is natural. So why is it making it? What, what is going on here? And so I went back and I said, okay, I want to make dough like my great-grandmother used to make yeah. 150 years ago. How did she make it? What did she do? So what, what she kind do? of flour you use? So I use a generic flour, King Arthur. Okay. Very basic quote unquote it's not a uh overly commercial flour but that's what i'm using now yeah, it's and i know made it unbleached but it is unbromated unbleached absolutely yes yeah. but which is great it is not any flour that's unbromated unbleached is fucking it's winning. a step forward in, right in my opinion but but it's not something mind-blowing it's right. not something that people say oh he's using a uh, flour it's sure. not. 
is middle of the road, right? But you're one, you're one in ten percent of places out here probably using a flour that's all bromated in the pizza game, even in Las Vegas. Fair enough. But my my point is that I'm 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 using an average dough, uh, an average flour, and I'm treating it in the way that people used to treat flour 150 years ago. Yeah. Which means zero commercial yeast. Mm -hmm. Now there's people that put me in the category of flat earthers when I say don't use commercial yeast. I don't like commercial yeast. I don't like yeast made in a laboratory. I want my yeast to come naturally because why? It's it's there. Yeast is everywhere. But I know you can't. Can All you right. see the camera? I'm gonna Look. fire back at it's you every, a little bit. I love I'm it. I'm gonna fire back at you. Fire a little back! Bit. I can't wait. So so here's where I am. Uh, first of all, I, I think you'll like this a lot. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but back in the day when the internet was a lot younger, and you know, you the things you looked up weren't as uh, uh, curated. Let's say. Uh, I was finding these articles that were comparing like, okay, why did they call bread and wine body of blood of Christ? And it's like the reason why they did back then was because the wine and the bread was made out of this wild fermented yeast product that like was like magic. You know what I mean? It was magic. You add this to this thing and it turns it into this amazing thing. Can you imagine thing. not understanding flour, not understanding science? And then anywhere you are in the world, it just becomes it in, alive. And all of a sudden it's this big and it becomes this big. And something How that's is that not dead. Magical? Well, something that we understand as dead. We understand today, scientists, is flour alive or dead? It's dead. But when you add water to it and give it time, it becomes alive. Like, it's literal magic. Um, and that's how it was viewed. Or perceived magic. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Right. I, I think it's still pretty magical because there's a lot of things involved in it. I think it's beyond magical. I think it's divine. I think it's... A like, exactly. I, I, I well, I consider magical. magic and divine like the same thing. You know what I mean? What is divine in the end of the day? Um, but what just happened? I don't know. All of a sudden, like... I'm getting feedback. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Went away. Now, now I'm talking. No. Anyway. Just keep on going because you were in a roll, man. <laughs> you were going. Don't worry. So, so, yeah. So, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And then uh, I had to talk with my uncle who's like a semi-theologist. And I was yeah. like, after I read this stuff, I was like, all right, Uncle Gary and Pammy, what the fuck's going on with yeast? And they're like, well, in the Old Testament, yeast is evil. What? But in the, yeah, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, e yeast is evil. But in the New I Testament. I challenge that statement. <clears throat> but in the New Testament, it's supposed to be a divine thing. All right. Yeasted bread is like uh, a celebrated divine thing. And when it comes to Christian theology, Anything in the New Testament that contradicts something from the Old Testament is trumped. You understand? So. Are you pushing back on me? Can I push back on you? Yeah. So uh, here's my only thing. When you're done. When you're done. So the thing I'm going to push back on is I use wild yeast starter culture that I never put in the fridge. And I feed the same time every day. Yeah. In every single one of my doughs at different percentages. But. I also use IDY fresh yeast and instant yeast to create different things. But I'm always adding between 10 and 30% of the wild yeast starter culture to the dough. So there's enough percent to create the, the you know, starch resistance that lowers the glycemic index a lot uh, to create the flavor because it's such a big percent of the dough that it's instantly created. And then I can manipulate without, I see the problem as fermentation during aeration. What a lot of guys will do is they'll fill up a cup of salt, fill up a cup of sugar, and drop a half a block of yeast. You're not fermenting anything. You know what I mean? At yeah, that point. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm having a traumatic uh, uh, 
<laughs> but but aerate you're just aerating it when you're doing that. But aeration is important for flavor too. But, so maybe for, for, there's yes. products and textures of course to but release all, those flavors. If if I may be so bold, yes, sugar belongs nowhere. In my I I do opinion. not disagree with that, but if you go to uh, if you go to Sicily right now and get a spiccioni dough recipe from the highest level of the thing, they're putting five percent sugar in all their dough. I agree, but the difference is that Sicily has had fifty years of economic down downturn, mm. and they don't trust their own methods. Okay. They don't believe in what their great grandfathers used to do. Right, but and, like and if you want, and, it, and it's it, and it's a, it's it's insulting because they're adopting new world techniques because they want to stay relevant. Well, and they've been I doing wish, that a long time. I wish I wish I could speak to my compatriots in Sicily because I'll go to my 87 year old aunt that'll tell me how to make a dough before I'll go to a pasticcere that'll tell me how to make a dough. Right. Because I want to know how they made it 200 years ago. Because that was true for two millennia. Three millennia. And this is true for 20 years. Right. And we have to be cognizant. I think it's more than 20 years. Well, okay. After World 50? War II? It 50? Hasn't be fi it hasn't been after World War II because I'll tell you, my dad was born in 43. Okay. 43. And he, he tells me the story of when Lievito di Birra, which is uh, brewer's Cake yeast. yeast. Yeah, the brewer's fresh yeast, yeast, right? What everybody knows out there is fresh yeast. Lievito right. di Birra. Lievito di Birra. He said, I remember when that came into existence. I was 17 years old. I was in Musumeli. And none of us could muster eating the bread because it stunk. It stunk to us. It stunk like moldy mush. And now this is the standard. Right. And so I'm more interested in the man, by the way, he, he now do has you, adopted. Do you, a, but I, do, do you use a refrigerator for anything? Of course. You do. But they used to in the old days too. They used to use underground. Oh, no, 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 no. Underground. Sicily, especially where you're from, I'd be surprised if fucking like 2% of the population had refrigerators no, in the 1960s. It's not about refrigeration. Let's talk 200 years ago. Yeah. Okay. What my grandmother used to tell me is that to curate the yeast, they would drop it in a basket and lower it into the water well. Mm hmm because the temperature down by the water was at a cool 76 oh, yeah. degrees. Real cool. So they used to keep it down there to make sure that they make sure that the culture stayed fresh for them. Wow. And so they would pull it back up, do their crescenti, it was what they would call it, and then make bread. And there's people that still do that, Nino. There's people I mean, that still I'm do one that. of them. I have that fucking is wine what, fridges that where is, I keep it at 64 degrees. That is what, that, that is my life. That is what I want to, there is validity in that. I want to say to my Sicilian culture to, to hold on to those traditions, to not throw out the baby with the bath water. Yeah. Because there's such validity in the Durham wheat and the way they milled stuff and the way that they fermented things, the flavor, because at the end of the day, it's about the flavor and what it does to your body, right? Because if it tastes good, unless you're being tricked, right? And there's trickery in flavors. But if it's done naturally and it tastes good, that means it's good for us. I 100% I agree with that. And like, I mean, when you look at like recipes from Chad Robertson from Tartine Bread, in in lieu of doing a uh, you know a commercial yeast right in, um, he'll put eighty percent you know wild yeast starter culture and Polish, yeah, why instead not? of putting twenty percent, and that'll give the same result. Do and you, then lowering the hydration and yada 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 to get to the same thing. Do you know what the, the most insulting thing is? I I spoke to a very high level bread guy. Yeah. 
he's written 15 books. I won't name his, I won't mention his name. His name's Peter Reinhardt. He's the only guy that's wrote 15 books. I won't mention his name. <laughs> but the thing about it is that when I mentioned Biga, um, and again, I didn't mention any names, and I'm not saying, I, I, I esteem Peter immensely. I think he's one of the Hey, stop mentioning his name. We're cutting that out, Brady. Mark, yeah. mark the thing. Thank you. <laughs> no, but I, I love Peter, honestly. I love him, so, too. So, so let, let's go on, because, because that's not who I'm talking about. So the thing about it is is that he said to me, Biga is made from yeast. You make, a, yeah. you make it from commercial yeast. Let me ask you something. Yeah. I said ax, not ask. <laughs> let me ask you something. <laughs> Where did my great grandmother know fuck commercial yeast? Right. She made a bigo her whole life, from the moment she started learning how to make bread, to the moment she died. Where did she know? And she made bigo every time she made bread. So how, how do we standardize bigo with commercial yeast? Well, what it's been standardized as currently and i think this needs like you know again like everything else it needs a little bit of nuance but because biga polish wild yeast starter culture essentially mean the same though. it means the same thing right so what it's been standardized out to is if we say biga because we're just saying the same thing in different languages essentially so when we say Correct. biga we're talking about a 50 percent hydration on a pre-ferment what? Why? why? That's because false. we had to. That's I know. False. I know what the name. I know why. I, okay. The, the old, you know, saying, because we had to standardize the old, the old saying, right? Biga dura, biga sicura. Okay. What you know you explain that to me. Biga dura, a hard biga, uh -huh. is a secure biga. So it's 50 percent ish, 60 percent right. so it's hard, hydration. Yeah. Right. It's hard because yeah. it's 50 percent hydration. Then you have more control over it. Yes. Correct. So this is where it, it's got a lot more food in it. Right. But this is and that's where you get also that's where you get the walnuts flavor from. Right. Is the the hard because well, where you get like the you said water. you can keep it at 72 and if you need it more active you can bring it out into uh, the regular right, weather. But and that doesn't mean that that's what everybody did. Oh, uh, no. So what the was the saying, other one? The saying was, biga dura, biga sicura, right? Okay. But biga really means just a preferment. No, I know, 100 You, you had families that everybody, would do biga as they do Polish. Everybody agrees. Everybody agrees with what you're saying right now, I think, like anybody who knows anything. But the reason why it became biga's 50% hydration-ish. But and, why commercial yeast? And no, forget about commercial no, yeast. No, but that's what they say. They say that big has to be with commercial mm, yeast. Why? I don't think they really. Who does it? If they're saying that, they're wrong. I would so like some emails. I think we need a little bit more. Telling me why. <laughs> I think they may need. And then when they say Polish, it's a hundred ish percent hydration. Hundred ish, right? And when they say pate fermente, it's salt and hundred twenty percent. Yeah, yeah. Hydration. What, what, what about pan levant? Where's the pan I never levant? heard of that one. Levant bread. Levant? Uh, levant. Yeah, so levant. Isn't that about 70% Levant a, in America Can we is. Have, do, uh, do we have phone and callers? We don't have that. Because I, I like levant, to hear from Levant, I think, is currently, right now, and this might change next year or two years or three years, but levant is the preferred term over sourdough. In America, but it's the same to thing. describe oh. whoa, 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 to describe a natural love product, whether it's bigger or Polish or anything, because sourdough can be misleading. Yes, because it doesn't. Because sourdough have to be sour. is not a flavor. Yes, well, you can naturally love in a product without it being sour. Correct. So sourdough has been replaced with Levon. I, I think I just fell in love with you. I just want you to know. For that one statement. Well, because people I'm think, already in love with you. Because people think that sourdough means that it has to taste sour. No. But the best but, bakers, the best bakers ever were the ones that whose product didn't taste sour. Well, sourdough yeah, Chad Robinson process. describes his 
final Levon as a young Levon instead of a mature Levon. He says he doesn't prefer a mature Levon because he doesn't want his bread to be overly sour. He's not so, looking for that flavor. He's just yes. looking for a naturally a little, leavened product. A little product. acidity is great, but we want naturally yeah. leavened product. Yeah. And when you warm you, ferment can I, things... Can I, can I go off on a tangent for half yes, a second? Yes, absolutely you can. Do you know what the penalty for impersonating a bread maker in Roman era was? No. It was death. Death. Yeah, those guys were hardcore back then. If you said you were a bread baker and you couldn't produce a good loaf of bread, you were dead. They because fucking, the bread baking skill, they were powerful. They were because, a fucking crew. Because think about it. Think they weren't fucking it. not, they were hard motherfuckers. Yeah, but. <laughs> no, but the guilds, it, the guilds in Rome, whether you're talking were about the, the fish right. mongers or the bread bakers or whatever. But they, they they controlled the local fucking shit like the mafia. Yeah. Because they were because it was voting, you know, and the fucking dudes had to go to them to get the fucking votes they needed. I want to bring it back to what you were saying earlier. Bring it back. To what you, to to the fact that it was magic. And to those was, guys, it was magic. Yeah. Who could explain it? Who, no one could explain it. So if you said I'm a magician. I'm a bread baker, I'm a magician. And then you couldn't produce. You were done. No, that you was it. Done. And it was very secretive you know, back you, then too. Do you know do you know uh, another interesting fact? I'm sorry. Tell me. I'm so fucking No, crazy. don't be sorry. Just, Yo, you're love, here to I'm fucking geeking, talk. I'm I'm geeking out right now. Yo, you're here during, to geek out. During this during the Civil War in our yeah. country, there were bread bakers with the troops. You know what they used to do? They used to get their starter and they would put in a canister and they would sleep with it at night. So it would be the perfect temperature mm. to propagate for the next morning to make bread for the troops. And do you know how they cooked that? Or you don't? Tell me more. I don't. I don't know. I have no idea. So my understanding was that it was in a cast iron pot. Okay. Which existed coals, in the world. With the coals, yeah. coals underneath and coals on top. Makes that, perfect sense. And that's how they bake bread at, in that era. That but makes you, perfect do fucking think, sense. Do, you, do, do, you, do we realize the importance of bread bakers in humanity? And now we're looked at. I don't I think mean, most people do. They, they don't because we take it such for granted. Such for granted. But just stop a second. Just stop. Everybody stop for half a second and say, okay. I need bread, and there's no stores, there's no bakers, right? There's none of that. Modern humanity is non-existent. Stop for half a second. How do you make bread? How do you make bread? Think about it for half a second, the complexity that is involved. We take this art form at so, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm into your microphone. Oh, super sorry. We take this, we take this, our form so for granted and we shouldn't, we need to understand the validity of what we've done for humanity. What, what we have the I mean, this famines built, that we have this saved. This built humanity. I, I'll tell you one more Brand interesting bacon. fact. One more interesting fact. Okay, you give a person flour and water. They drink the water. They eat the flour. They won't last three months. That same human being puts flour and water together. That's a ferment. Six in a bake oven. They eat the bread. And they live indefinitely. Something happens in bread breaking. Right. They're getting their fucking hydration. They're getting their uh, nutrients Nutrition. delivered to them because of the it fermentation process and bringing it down. It is miraculous. It is miraculous. All right. I could, like, push back on that a little bit. How? But you're like, I could. But you're like 90% right. <laughs> um, the only thing I would push back on is the fact that, like, you know, no matter what 
uh, socioeconomical status that you had 200 years ago, you had access to this. You, you did. didn't. You did. No, you didn't. I, I, I will push back on you on that. Okay. Okay. You, you, and, tell and, me. And, and let me tell you why. For some, it was harder than others, categorically. And I think, I think what you're talking about is refined wheat versus just get wheat and mill it and make some basic no, bread. No, that's not what I'm talking about. So what are you talking about? So what I'm talking about is the fact that like, all right, look at um, before the Industrial Revolution, which didn't hit Italy until well after World War II, until at least like Mussolini started it in 1922 because of the war didn't get very far with it. He was trying to, you know, capture Ethiopia to be like a wheat belt. That didn't work out too well. Um, he had a lot of other things to worry about. And Italy didn't become industrialized in agriculture until really 10 years after World War II. Really, it was 20 years. Sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this. I know. It's a hard time. Because, because I'm, my pushback is... Let's talk about the kingdom of two Sicilies. Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the I'm fact I'm very that, familiar with that history. Let's talk about the fact that it was the wealthiest kingdom. It was. Top three in the world. Right, but who does that benefit back then? Because it's well, not just benefit, Italy who's dealing with these problems. It's everyone. Hold on. Everyone, then, the richest countries are cauldron cooking back then. Hold, hold, hold okay. on a second. Let, let, let me let's let's back up for half a second. Okay. The Kingdom of Two Sicilies was so prevalent that when the French had the revolution, all of their master chefs immigrated to southern Italy. Yeah. So much so that the word for master chef for southern Italy became Monzu which is derived from the word monsieur. That's where the word comes from. Let's, let, let's move on. Pasta. Pizza. Right? Bread at high level. All developed in the kingdom of two Sicilies. Correct. Right? With Naples as its capital. Correct. They weren't in an impoverished state. At the time, the kingdom was the third wealthiest kingdom in the world. Yes. With art and science and technology yeah, beyond but, but anything it that wasn't happens. A until the Piemontese society. It, it, it wasn't was, a what? It, it, that only benefited like the top 1% who it were the rulers and 5% it, 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 who worked it, it, for the rulers. It was aristocratic. A political system that I do not condone and do not believe but in. But all 100%. I'm saying is this idea of like this peasant cuisine in the kingdom of two, two I, Sicilies. I, I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you there. 95% the of the cuisine. 95% of the population was subsistence living. You're telling me French chefs fleeing France were working for uh, uh, peasants? You are absolutely correct. No. That didn't happen. And there happen. wasn't no such thing as restaurants back then. In no, the no, way that, that we that, understand that is them correct. I believe I, I agree with you. Uh, That's all I'm saying. I, I agree with you 100. percent The the cuisine, cuisine evolved and persisted, but in the ruling classes, just like everywhere else. People that think our food is peasant food is uneducated. Yes, and I agree with you 100. percent Okay. And I will always. I, I, I also need to say one, just half a second. Yeah. That the what what the Piemontesi. These are the southern Italians. Fucking was wasn't exactly. Oh man, you're gonna what, get me on a rant right yeah, now. Yeah, don't 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 go don't go off because you might get in a political turmoil. No, no, but no, no. Wasn't no, no. wasn't Not exactly gentlemanly. Turmoil. Wasn't no, exactly gentlemanly. It wasn't. And the no, I'm saying you're gonna make me go off because this takes a little bit of time to explain. So when you read like there's a great book called Taroni, that's I think like standard fucking reading. I hate, I hate reading. that term, by the way. Huh? I hate the term. But do you I know the take, book? So that's the book, the book that I'll explains, look, I'll, like, like. I'll look into it. 
that's a book that everybody reads. I think it was just recently um, uh, translated into English. But Taroni is like explaining like the rape of you know the Piedmontese Sardinian kingdom of the kingdom of Savoy um, and what they did to the kingdom of two Sicilies and stripping the wealth and subjugating the people in a very brutal way. The reason and why the they did that was because the massacres that happened. Oh yeah. That no one talks about. And the reason millions why, of people the reason why they did that is because the money. kingdom of two Sicilies was strong and when they unified the country, you know, all these other things were like very small, fell in line very easily. And they were worried about, the, they're like, this is far from our base of power. We have to fucking rob these people of our shit. And it was fucked up. Yeah, no, it was right? fucked up. It, it, was a, it was a means to, to, to stabilize but the But for the average person, the it made their life more fucked up. But that's why we their saw, life was already fucked up. Yeah, but that's why they left, though. That's why they left Southern Italy. When did they leave? Well, what, what was it? 1880s? 1890s? Well, with the Barantos? That's, that's, <laughs> that's why they all left. Yeah. Because there was no future. They all saw it. The people, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, they were starving. And You're talking about emigrating. You're talking about right? the diaspora. Right. Yeah, they were fucking starving to well, death. Why did that happen? When we were the wealthiest, we were the third wealthiest nation in the in the world. For and we can't we for and then the we wealthy. became the then we became the starving nation of the world. How did that happen? Except for the Piemontese. It got I'm sorry. It got, you're, sorry you're for not my wrong. Piemontese friends. You're right, but but the idea that it was fucking like uh, dope. Everybody was doing fucking good before that. You know what opportunity no, did they have not, to leave not, not before everybody. that? It was no. no the eighteen eighties provided no. an opportunity to come to America. Not, not America was, was a backwater before eighteen eighties, which you but couldn't immigrate to. Hold, hold on a second. How many people? How many Sicilians immigrated to the United States prior? Millions. Hold on. Prior to eighteen sixty one. I, I, I do so, not know so the I answer invite, to that question. So I invite you, but I invite America, you to do America was in war. Before they were in war, they were literally a backwater who weren't accepting any immigrants. Oh, yeah. That was, that was a shit show. Look. Who was there going was to America? There was a lot of bad Were everywhere, the Germans right? going to America before 1880? I don't, I don't they know. They weren't. I don't know about German history. All I can speak about is the Irish, the Italians, the Germans. They weren't coming until, here before those not, times. Not until 1861. Right. Ita Southern Italians were not immigrants, were not immigrating until the Piemontesi took over Southern Italy. That's a very important fact to it, remember. It is a fact, but because it wasn't. It, there was no ships in Italy to take them over of during that time. Of course there was. Of course of there was. Of course there was. Get got so fired. Ma get got so easy. From Genoa, they were coming all the time. But from, from Naples, they weren't. Yeah. It's not until the Piemontesi conquered southern Italy when that, you, that here, they immigrated. Here, riddle me this. Yeah. All right. When you imagine a not, ship. Yeah. All right. When you see a video or you imagine or there's a picture drawn. Is it a sail ship? Well, sure. At that time, no. At that time, why not? No. When Christopher Columbus engine? came over, explorers were in sail ships. Yeah. When immigrants came over, what were they on? Steamboat. Steamboats. Yeah. So sure. steamboats were invented during that time, and that's what made it possible for the mass immigration of these people, because before it was in it, fucking I possible. I understand what made it possible, but what gave the will? Why the did people, ability why, and and things got worse? But why I'm did not people, saying things didn't get why worse? Why do people get up and say I'm going to leave my, everybody I love? I'm going to leave everything I know because we're fucking starving to death. Correct. Worse. Worse. Correct. We went from 1,200 to 800 calories. Correct. Yeah. That's what happened. But they should have had 2,000. And why did? But it happen? 1,200 calories is still subsistence loving. But why did it happen? The Piedmontese. 
I'm being sorry. I, I'm, I'm not sorry. I agree with you completely. I'm okay, sorry. Gio, we got to rewind there real quick. I might be quick. outing myself as a No, crazy you're fine. Guy. You're fine. <laughs> no, you're not crazy. You are of the same belief as the vast majority of Italians today. Um, I know a bunch of guys on might. the other side. This is what I, they're I'm going to say something really crazy. Hold on. I may hold believe. on. Gio, Gio. Yeah, yeah, no. Sorry. I'll focus. No. Gio, I need your fucking history right now. When did you come to America? Where did you immigrate to when you were 12 or 13? Okay. My life story. Yes. You need this. Okay. So I was actually born in the United States. My parents immigrated here in 69. When I was six years old, my parents decide to move back. My father stayed here. My mother went back to curate a home. And they tried to figure out how they were going to move back. And I was 13. I said, oh, the fuck is this shit? My dad's in America, <laughs> land of opportunity. And I'm sitting here with sheeps and goats. I think I want to go back. <laughs> and I made the drive to come back. Because in my view, and this is when I get political, in my view, the system I was living with was not working. Where, where did you, where did he and move I was to? In, Brooklyn? I, I was in Kanikati. Did he move to Brooklyn though? No, in America? no, where did he move I went to? straight to Southern California. Okay. In a, in a town called Montebello. Oh, okay. Huge Italian community. I didn't know how lucky I was. We had six Italian delis, four Italian restaurants in a community of 36,000 people. And it was, it was absolutely wonderful. And, um, yeah, that's my life story. That, that's, that's all I got. It's so not very interesting. That's all I got. You get to Southern California, you're 13. I know not a word of English. You don't know a word of English? Not a single word. Really? I forgot all of my English. Did you get put in it. ESL? I did. Did you? Yeah. I you speak Sp pretty I good English today. I learned Spanish before I learned Sp English. Get the fuck out. No, I, I swear to you. Great. Because everybody around me spoke Spanish. Spanish is so close to Italian. I learned Spanish before I learned English. Categorically. So when you... All right. So now you're over here. You're with your mother. Your father's already here. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. So he's in Southern California. My in mother's little in town. We're, 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 all, we're all in Southern California and, and Montebello. And what, is, what are they doing? So my mother is... What are they doing to, like, get by? My mother is... Uh, they, were, they were doing all right. My mother was a seamstress for Ethan Allen. And my dad was a... My dad was a quality control inspector for, uh, not Boeing, no, no, Northrop. They used to make missiles, Northrop. No, yeah, no. Northrop is like a um, industrial, uh, military industrial yeah, complex. Missiles, that, yeah, he, he was an engineer. Raytheon, Northrop. Uh, yeah, that's, what he, that's what he did. What's the other big one? I don't know. Brady, you know. What am I thinking of? God but, damn it. But that's, that's what he did. He, he, that, that's what so he, he came thing. from Italy and got that job right away? Well, that, well, no, no. He worked his way up to that. That's why he never went back. Well, tell me that fucking story. I want to know. Well, like, you should have my dad here story. because my dad is Well, tell me what awesome you know. Movie. I'll have you. Your dad's you alive? Yo, yeah. Oh, we're oh, going to yeah. have him fucking on. Yeah. We should have him on. We're going to have him on, but Before I want you, you to tell your version of the so, story. So my dad, the thing about it is that my dad, he, his issue, he, he loves Italy. He loves Sicily. And he wanted to move back. That's why he sent us over. But the thing about it is he went back and he's like, what am I going to do here? You know, he's working. He was an engineer. He was doing parts for missiles and gears and all this stuff. And he's like, what am I going to go do in Sicily? I'm going to tend to sheep? I mean, what am I, what am I going to do over here? But, but how did he learn all that? Did he go to school here? Like, like how did he get when, into that? When, when he came here, my father, his first job was scrubbing scrap metal to be recycled for these factories. 
And he put himself through adult school, put himself through adult high school, put himself through community college, went into engineering, and then got, his, got himself into a job to do that quality control thing. That's, that's what he did. So you're telling me he just broke his fucking calzone, broke his ass, went to all these schools, worked shitty jobs, raised money until he got the education to get into one of these fields and like the That's you know, stepping stone. That's correct. That's fucking incredible. That's what he did. And then he, like a fucking genius, he went to the restaurant business. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you, <laughs> what are you doing in the restaurant business? Well, my, my, so he essentially, they made enough nest egg to where they just, they were done in the mid fifties. Isn't that everybody's dream? Right. Mid yes, a hundred percent. They were done. They didn't want anything fancy, but they had enough money. They just they were done, and then their pizza maker son, yours truly, said, "Hey, you know what you should do? You should open up a restaurant." Of course, <laughs> like like an idiot. Wait, this idea of the planet. So that that's what they did. And they over, they had three tables, and then it went into eight tables and then it went for 15 tables and then it went to 20 tables and now they have a restaurant that sees uh, 320 people today today yeah really yeah it's called they nora's, still run it it's called nora's cuisine yeah. yeah what is it called nora's 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 cuisine and what does that mean no nora's my mother's name oh nora's yeah nora's cuisine in monticello california no no they're here in las vegas in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. We moved from Montebello. So when they decided, I'm sorry, I'm confusing everybody. <laughs> when they decided to retire, quote unquote, they came to Las Vegas. Okay. And what what was shits, the reasoning behind that? For, well, two reasons. Did they like to gamble? One, one I don't want to, one I shouldn't say, but my one mother. One they like to gamble a lot. But my mother likes to gamble. I, I shouldn't <laughs> say that. But the other thing is that my, my mother also suffered from arthritis. She uh, suffers from arthritis. And the desert heat, the lack of humidity helped her with helps that. Helps it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she sure. felt a lot better in the desert. So they yeah. decided to move here. People have been sending people out to the desert over here for hundreds of years yeah. because like and, and tuberculosis, then, arthritis, whatever it is. All that stuff, right? And so, and so now they're bored and for shits and giggles, <laughs> <laughs> they open up a restaurant. <laughs> ah, we know how to cook. Let's uh, let's share a cuisine with everybody. Yeah. Why the fuck not? <laughs> but here we are, thirty years later. Thirty years later, they've done wonders. So, so, but you have a different spot. I do. I do. My place is called Monzu. Again, okay. the, the name that I was telling well, you. Well, what is what is what, oh, and old When did you start it? Because I know nothing about this. When did you start it, and what is it all about? I know what you're passionate about. You're passionate about why you started cultures and doing the yeah. stuff the old school way. All yeah. right. So I started but making What is my zoo? What does it mean? Remind us all. And so again, Monsieur was from leftover from Monsieur from the French Revolutionary War, where all the cooks came down to southern Italy. And they were they couldn't say Monsieur, so they said Monsu. So so that so means, means that it, it means like chef. It my means head kid, okay. Uh, so my translation chef. is that uh, is like you master give cook. a fuck. You know about what, I mean? what you're doing. About what you're doing, you're gonna yeah. use any any advantage, any uh, evolution, any new technique. You're not limiting Correct. yourself to anything. They're professional. Yes, you're a professional. They're, you're a professional. That's what That's that means. What Monsu means. means you're a fucking professional in the kitchen. So, right? so then what's the goal of your kitchen and what does your kitchen provide? Because I've never been to your restaurant. I'm very curious. You're coming to dinner tomorrow. I, and if I, you don't, <laughs> I'm going to kidnap you and bring you to my restaurant. Good fucking what luck, the, bro. I got people. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so in, in all seriousness, I see myself as a curator of old techniques. Okay. That's right. That's where I live. Because I think that something that transcends generations has a truth that is inexplicable, inexplicable, inexplicable. You, you, you said it right. I didn't because the friend of Broncos blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You can't explain in other words. You can't explain. Yes. The friend of Broncos kicking my butt. <laughs> uh, it is, it is, it, we can't explain it. And 
to me, that is truth. To me, that is stuff that matters. And so, curate. Because molecular science tells us that in a shallow pot, because the atoms go up and down, it creates flavors. And yet, our great-grandmother knew to cook sauces in a shallow pot because it tasted better. Right. And I trust my grandmother better than molecular science because hey, it's time tested. You know, I don't, I don't think you're wrong. Like, there's a, um, there's a real bias, you know, like when you're, when you're studying something and like something else that works doesn't make sense and you take a look at it. If you look at it in 1% the wrong way, you're not going to fucking get it. You understand? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm in 100% agreement with you. I think it's, you know, learn what we can because we have access to, like, unlimited information today. Um, you don't have to go to CIA we got, we, anymore. We got to Google. You don't, yeah, you got to Google. You don't have to go to French <laughs> Culinary Institute. You can literally learn everything for a fraction of the cost of, like, the cost of entry, which it's is about, between, like, 100000 It's about curiosity. Yeah. No, and you no, got to no be one, curious. No. So, so on that, what do you serve at your restaurant? Like if somebody walks into your restaurant, there's people listening from all around the country, maybe all around the world that speak English. Um, when they walk in, what are they getting? Hmm. They're getting a flavor profile that was truth to our great grandparents. So, 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 so let's talk about, first of all, a cornerstone is the dough that I spoke about. Cornerstone. Right? Yeah. Natural fermentation, the flavor in that. And then recipes that aren't really valued. I feel like cuisine today has gone to how many ingredients can we pile up on a frickin' plate. And instead, what I wanna know is how do we express three ingredients perfectly? That's mm. what I wanna know. Like my grandmother's chicken that I have on that dish. And so, so when you have that chicken dish in my restaurant, it's like you're eating at my grandmother's house. And really all it has is chicken, onions, and potatoes. And and how is that broke? Are you so I'm slow roasting it? Of course, I have slow, olive oil, a little bit right. of butter, salt, paper. Of course, there's other. Your ingredients. sous chefs are like picking all three of these ingredients, trying to make them perfect, and then and combining them for the plate. It's all about methodical, very precise timing. You put it in the oven for this much time. You uncover it for this much time. You roast it for this much time, and it's duplicating because. At the end of the day, you know what I, God, what I want is when people come to my restaurant, is for them to feel like they're eating in my home. It's like they come for Sunday dinner and they're eating my food that I cook for my family. That's what I want. And if I could do that, then I'm successful. I don't care about the numbers, how many people come in. How profitable I am. I know that's crazy to think that way as a businessman, but I want people to eat my food and say, I'm at Giovanni's Sunday dinner. And that is my measure of success. I got a question for you. Why don't you fucking do that once a week? I, what, are you, what? Are you challenging me right now again? No, no, no. no. I'm just asking you. <laughs> No, I'm asking you. Like, I know my wife might my, my wife might kill me if I bring me. Well, I'm just saying, like, are, are you closed any days of the week, or are you I'm open not. seven days? Why don't you take Sundays and say Sundays, like, it's let's say it's reservation only. There, if you have a food allergy, go fuck yourself. Like, <laughs> like do it. Like, there's a there's a spot in um um. Uh, Staten Island. Uh, it's called uh, fuck. I forget the fucking name of it, but it's a it's they for years now they have a set like three grandmas with three different menus. Oh, I love but it. But for like five years they had a running ad in the American OG like Italian newspaper, 
and every week they would like give the grandma like three you know uh cooks not even sous chefs like just cooks to help them out and then nona would come in there and she could have been from like any part of italy or any part of new york or new jersey or whatever it doesn't matter she knew how she to cook. would make a menu it would be set it was family style you walk in you pay you know whatever it is 70 dollars and they serve you whatever you want whatever you it is diet, yeah if you got a dietary restriction go fuck yourself <laughs> like there's no it's my dream come true well what you could do it every sunday geo like just just grab your fucking balls with your hands all right and say you're gonna fucking do it all right because you shouldn't be open fucking you're going against your culture by being open seven days a week to begin with Fair all enough. right so Fair say enough. i'm gonna pay homage to my fucking culture by on sundays which is a religious holy fucking day and instead of fucking going to church I'm gonna have the mm. fucking Monsignor over in fucking Vegas come over and bless this fucking day that we're fucking devoting it to this old school fucking shit that everybody should have fucking up. All right? That's some. Wow. On that note, we're taking a small you break. Just, you just blew my mind right now. We're gonna be right back. We're gonna let. What are you, where are we going? We're, we're going to get a fucking cigarette and another drink. We'll oh, be right back. Oh, God. <laughs> 